Hello, are we live or? Yeah, we're live now. Hey, Grimer, are you live? I am live most of the times. When are you? When are you not? Uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays, I am not live. So, the thing is Tuesday. I was gonna say we beat it by a day. Oh yeah. So, any specific hours that you to turn offline, or that is for the entire day then? Ooh. Grimer, do you have hours or is it the entire day? Yeah, so mostly night hours. I'm off uh, from like, I go to bed at like 8.30 p.m. and I wake up at like um, 8, 8 a.m. so I get enough sleep. So that's usually my routine. A lot of highs in the chat. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi all. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Nice. Grimer, I think you missed a few. Yes, it's going too fast. Let's go. Okay. Oh, I need I need a better mouse. It's like slowly. It's going so fast. You should use the trackpad. Do you have one of the magic trackpads over there? Yeah, actually I do. Hello, Drum Madrid, from Madrid probably. They're typing too fast. Deborah, Anthony, Brandon. Cool. Okay. I guess it's time to get started then. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Hello, all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone present here, and also to those who are going to join us from YouTube Live. Hope you're having a great start to the new year. Welcome aboard on ADP List and Webflow Original Series, where we will be helping you bringing up imagination to reality and together building up websites that stand out in a completely visual canvas. The series would feature Webflow University experts and ADP List with Noclist mentors will be interacting live with you and help you learn Webflow in four weeks. For the first session, we have with us the OG and the, the face of Webflow University. Maguire will be of education and Webflow community efforts, including production of courses and lessons for the Webflow University. So without further ado, please help me welcome Maguire, who will be introducing us to the realm of no code and then further to Webflow. Over to you, Maguire, and here we go. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me and having Greemer and Emily and Nelson. And uh, on behalf of the Webflow team, couldn't be more excited uh, to not only talk with you, but to welcome this group. Uh, couldn't be more excited about this opportunity. Uh, I am very, very, very excited to be joined uh, by my creative partner and accidental matching sweater uh, colleague today, Grimer Grimson from uh, Iceland. Uh, Grimer, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent, and I'm very happy to be here too with you. Uh, accidental, I wouldn't say so. I saw the sweater that you uh, packed this morning. I got ice everywhere, so uh, that was not a coincidence. Uh, but yeah, very excited to be here and excited to participate in in this session with everyone. So for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with Webflow, uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of a different route than a traditional you know, product demo or pitch. That's not what this is. Uh, for us, we both, and maybe Grimer, if you want to talk about this in a second, we both actually got into Webflow uh, in interesting ways. Uh, for me, I was doing a bunch of agency work. We were developing professional websites for uh, professionals, law firms, doctors, dentists, and uh, we were doing a lot of hand coding. Uh, uh, I was contracting a lot and working with uh, people who were much better at front end and back end than me. But um, when we discovered Webflow, it was very much this feeling of, oh, I'm just taking the fundamentals, the same fundamental properties of HTML, CSS, uh, and a lot of the back end um, tech that I would be used to, spin up a, a, a database, connect it to the front end to build these sites. Again, somewhat straightforward sites, but sometimes a little more complex, uh, especially when you uh, tie in a CMS. And when I first found Webflow, it kind of felt like cheating because suddenly I didn't have to contract out as many uh, front end projects and uh, actually not, not as many back end projects too. Um, but since then, it's been this, this uh, wild journey. I think it was 2014 for me, a wild journey of getting more and more familiar, not just with Webflow, but with visual development overall, uh, and how visual development tools of all types, design tools, development tools, uh, and everything in between uh, are super empowering because they let me, they let people around me in very, very many cases, uh, design and build 
faster, more efficiently, and I'm not having to worry about the syntax of, for instance, CSS Grid or Flexbox. Um, that's my little uh, uh, tidbit about God, the last eight, nine years with eight, eight years with Webflow. Uh, Greamer, uh, how about you? How do you get into this? I already know the answer to this question. I just find it an interesting story. Well, I first discovered Webflow in my last semester at school. And uh, to be frank, to be honest, uh, coding wasn't my strongest. I'm so uh, sorry, Grimmer, did you, did you say you're frank? Or is, is it, that, how was do that you say you to be school? frank, right? Like that's a saying, right? To be frank or to, like, to be honest? I thought your name was Grimmer. Yeah, so I have multiple names. Uh, frank is one of them. So, so when I was frank in school, uh, I... Um, it threw me off there, but yes, I was frank. But coding wasn't like my strongest part. And I, I discovered Webflow, and, I, and suddenly, like you're mentioning, I started connecting it. I, I, I was like connecting HTML and CSS better than uh, actually just diving straight into the code. So I, I saw it visually. I've always been a, uh, a little bit more of a visual learner. So I just became um, a, a huge fan and started using it. Started, uh, you know, discovering more and more. Uh, no code tools, I guess, and 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 I became uh, a huge fan of Webflow, and and here I am. It's like it's a longer story, but that's that's how I I got into it. I couldn't be more excited, not only that you got into it, but now that we have the opportunity to work together. Uh, and I would say that on camera, I would say that off camera. I'm pretty sure I say that off camera a lot, and will not stop saying that. Um, couldn't be more excited. Uh, so with that in mind. Uh, like I said, this is going to be a little bit different today. We're not going to dive straight into Webflow. Of course, we're going to get into Webflow. And over the next several sessions, we'll be getting deep into things like layout and interactions and see if I mean, we'll, we'll cover the gamut. Uh, but for today, we're going to start a little bit differently. And one of the things that we find enormously effective is to before diving into Webflow, and a lot of people, especially if you have front end experience, maybe your uh, UX design, and you are already familiar with front end, even back end, maybe you are a full time front end engineer, uh, and you're looking to, to learn a little more, or just get familiar uh, with some of this. Or maybe you've never touched code uh, at all or touched front end or back end uh, at all. And that's okay because in this session, we're going to cover all the basics, uh, but we're going to do it in a little bit different of a way. Uh, so, what I want to do now, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share a Chrome window. So, give me just a moment. Should be Google and share. Greamer, can you see my screen okay? Not, not. Yep, I see. Anymore. I see it both in the room and on the screen, so it's good. Double see it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're actually going to start talking about three of those principles that many of us may be familiar with, but it's an important reminder that these are the backbone. These are the core of what. Uh, uh, what gets rendered by web browsers, and we're starting as any good uh, as any good lesson does on Google. Uh, and the primary thing I want to cover in the next few examples, we're going to look at Google. We'll look at Apple. We'll look a little bit at Stripe, and then we're going to get into Webflow. Um, but the reason I want to look into Google first, and the reason uh, we want to start here, is we want to cover the box model. We're going to cover HTML, a little bit of HTML. We're not going to get into the syntax deeply. We're not going to be you know, hand coding from scratch here. Uh, but we are going to look at the fundamentals of HTML. We're going to look at the fundamentals of CSS. The reason we're doing that is because as we're going deep into Webflow, Webflow is built on the same exact development properties uh, that are used by engineers at Google and Apple and Stripe. Uh, and we find that it's really enormously impactful, especially early on, to dive deep into those fundamentals. Um, because the closer we are to understanding how the web is built, and the closer we are to understanding that once we know how it's built, we can mess with it and build anything ourselves. Uh, there's almost nothing we can't do. Uh, so that's why I want to start with Google. So what I'm going to do here, and if you're following along live, the way we're going to do this is we'll demo some stuff. Uh, you're more than welcome to follow along if you're on laptop, desktop. We happen to be using Google Chrome here, but if you're using Safari, Firefox, it's all good. We have no strong preferences. Chrome just happens to be what we have uh, right here. Uh, but what we'll do in, in Chrome uh, right now is we're actually going to right click and inspect. And the reason we're doing this, I have it on a separate window. So give me a second while I have it brought back into this window. Doc, to the right side. All right, Grimer, can you see my inspect window? Yep. All right. I can see it. You got it. So what we have here, uh, again, all I did was right click on Google, went into inspect. And all we have right here is essentially on the left, we have all of our content, all of our HTML. It's not important what this code is right now. 
We don't have to dig into the syntax really, really specifically. All we're going to do is we're going to hover over different areas, each of these different nodes in HTML, to see that each of these things is just a series of boxes. Uh, and that may seem simple at first, but for us, it's profoundly important because 99% of what's built in front end is expressed in boxes on the web. Uh, and if you want, you can always uh, uh, click in to kind of see what's inside each, each of these boxes. You can follow it. You can open each of these carrots. Are we ever going to get to something inside? Let's see. Uh, we'll open this one. We have divs here. And it's just really helpful. There's our search bar. It's just really helpful to see that literally all of this is just boxes. And if we want, so let's see. Right click on Google Inspect. Let's find it's an image right there. If we want to delete Google, what do we do? We can just click here, press delete, and we deleted Google. Pretty interesting. Uh, and of course, maybe Google search right here. Let's right click that button, go to inspect, see if it takes us right there. That's fine. Let's delete that. And we deleted search. So all we have is a blank site and it says I'm feeling lucky. Um, oh, now it says I'm feeling curious. Now it says I'm feeling lucky. OK, well, that's going to be a, a pattern. Um, the point here is that we can see at any time the content on the left and of course our styling on the right by just right clicking and going to inspect. Again, right click inspect. We can see our content over here. And we see our styling for whatever that currently selected thing is on the right. So pretty basic. That's deleting Google. Let's go to apple.com. So for those who haven't seen, uh, Apple just uh, had some pretty big product announcements. Of course, the upgraded MacBook Pro, uh, supercharged by M2 Pro and M2 Max. We have the Mac Mini. We have the new HomePod, which has, I think, Greamer did have it. Okay, like, can you did you just delete Google? Is like, is it gone or what's going on? Like, can you not like? I'm curious. yeah. If you go to Google on your end, you'll notice it's also uh, deleted. Oh. It's probably why our phones are ringing. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at any time, I agree with that's actually an excellent point. All the changes you're making when you're inspecting whatever browser you're using, of course, these are just local changes. So if we go back up to refresh and refresh, we see Google is back. So there's nothing you can break. All these changes are happening on the client side. They're happening in your browser. So as you're experimenting with different things on the web, it's OK. It's all good. You're not going to break anything. Uh, great question, Greamer, and thanks for, for bringing that up. Uh, here's Apple.com, of course. Uh, we talked about some of these new product announcements. Here's one that says MacBook Pro supercharged by M2 Pro and M2 Max. Let's see what those cost. So we're in San Francisco right now. So we're on the US store version of Apple.com on an internet connection that seems to be you know, a bit slower than expected. That's okay. It's the reality of of the web. It's loading up the prices. Honestly, the prices must be mm -hmm. pretty intense for it to take this long. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How long until it gets awkward? I mean, it depends on your own feelings. You know. I feel pretty. Much... I feel pretty good about this. Yeah. I like that it still says connecting. I'm it's... gonna move over to another tab. That's it. Yeah. Impatient. All right, here we go. MacBook Pro, mover, maker, boundary breaker. Let's right click on the price here. It says from $19.99. We'll go to right click. We'll go to inspect. Whoop, right click and inspect. We'll see the same thing we saw before. Again, we're just hovering over and seeing that each of these elements, each of these HTML elements is expressed in a box. These are just boxes that stack on top of each other and sometimes next to each other, like these two right over here, based on properties that we set. That is it. The web is just made of boxes. And we call that often the box model. And that box model concept is, of course, yes, it's boxes, but we can actually tell those boxes what to do. In HTML, we're defining what that content is. What's that content? What's that structure? What order are these elements in? For instance, right here on MacBook Pro, if you see just right-clicking, you'll see I'll right-click sometimes on a specific element. I do that because when we go to inspect, it'll generally take you pretty close to or right on that element that's selected. You can see it's a, a H2, a heading level 2 uh, on the page. There's probably a lot of H2s. We have another one that says Mac Mini, right-click, inspect. You can see this is an H2. Uh, for our Mac Mini, we could do the same thing we did before. We can go to inspect, and if we wanted to, we could delete it. But what I really want to do on this page is I want to right click 1999 and inspect because, you know, it might be a M MacBook Pro, yeah, M2, right? M2 Pro, M M2 Max. That might be a good deal, but I think we can do better. So I'm just going to, right here, it says there's a hero pricing div. A div is just a box that holds other boxes, of course. A lot of us know that. Um, let's go in here and let's take this, just double click. It says from 1999. Let's see what happened if we knock off a nine there and press return. And that's it. We changed the price on the MacBook Pro. Greamer, how's that price? That's pretty good. 
yeah, I'll definitely, I would go for it. I mean, if you can change it to a little bit uh, I mean, cheaper. while we're here, yeah, a little bit yeah. cheaper. Let's do five dollars. So we're just changing the content. So in the first one, we deleted Google. Fine, that's you know an exciting uh, thought. But in this case, we're showing you can just right click. And when you see content that's expressed here in the code, again, there's a lot going on. Span, class, equals, typography, hyphen, hero, hyphen, product, hyphen, head. There's a lot of stuff going on. But if we just look for the text itself, we can double click and we can say, hello. And of course, Apple is now saying hello to Greamer. Yeah, it's definitely speaking to me. I'm buying it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so first tab, Google. Second tab, didn't load. Let's see if we all oh, hit finally loaded. Uh, and let's take a look. Let's go for the high end one. Let's change that from $30.99 to what's your price, Screamer? What do you got? Um, I would say like maybe $4. $4. So we get the higher end machine and it's yeah. cheaper. Okay, that's, that's great. $4. Uh, and that's a savings. Uh, so we're in a good a good place here, particularly that in the fact that we changed the prices on two Apple products, and you know Apple is now speaking to Greener. So again, we deleted content uh, in in some of these cases. Uh, we modified content in a couple of these cases. What happens if we were to start moving things around? Let's just try this real quick. I'm going to collapse again. You can just drill drill down into any of these at any time. What happens if you just start moving things around? So if you click and drag. You see, we're just moving those boxes. They're pushing each other around. And that's the box model by default. So I said before, the box model is just based on this idea that things on the web are expressed in boxes. And they stack on top of each other and next to each other based on properties that we get to set. Uh, we covered, of course, on the left here is the content. We haven't really talked about the styling. That's OK. Let's talk about the styling. So let's use the Mac Mini. I know they just refreshed this as well. Let's inspect and see what's selected. So. We have a, a few things going on here. So with just this text select, what's up? You can't hear me. Well, I don't know what to say. Can you hear me now? Greamer, if you want to take over audio. I can't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Let us know in the chat. Can you hear me? Is it just Greamer? It, yeah, it sounds like a lot of people can agree. It sounds like it's just you. It's just me. Whoa, it sounded you sound like a robot, but like a, a really powerful robot. Uh, but we're good. It sounds like a lot of people are saying we can hear you. And we spent about four minutes uh, asking this question. And so thanks. Yeah, I just need attention. I'll, I'll get my stuff together here. Well done. <laughs> All right. So where were we? We were right clicking and actually taking a look at some of this stuff in this heading. We can see a lot of this stuff expressed to the right. So we see font size, 56 pixels. Of course, we could change that to something like 26 pixels. And we're seeing we're modifying the styling as well. So if all of our content and our structure is our HTML, then all of our layout and all of our styling is CSS. So that's what we're expressing over here. To the left, we have our HTML, all those boxes of content. And to the right, we have the CSS, which is all of our styling styling that's being expressed. Um, so we'll look at a few examples here. Maybe this is a, a good example to, to dig into. So let's right click MacBook Air. We're going to do the same thing. We know already we could, for instance, change the content. We've done that trick before. Uh, but what happens if we change the color? We're going to change it to a blue color, maybe a, a pink color. And there's two things to notice. One is the currently selected stuff is changing to this sort of fuchsia color. Maybe we want to. Green, that's that's searing the, the eyeballs there. It's maybe a red. So we're noticing it's changing on this, but it's also changing elsewhere as well. And that's really the power of CSS. Back in the day in 95, 96, before the CSS spec was fully implemented, before CSS was anywhere nearly as powerful as it was today, uh, you would have to change, just as you might in uh, an older version of Photoshop, you'd have to change everything manually. You would have to you have to go in and say, hey, I have these four columns, and I want to change MacBook Air, the M1, the M2, MacBook Pro 13, MacBook Pro 14 and 16. You'd have to change them one by one each and every time. And God forbid, if you want to go back and make another change, you'd have to change them all again. With CSS, we can use different tags, different classes. Essentially, we call these selectors, different selectors. And a selector is essentially saying, hey, everything that matches this property. So in this case, this selector here is just all heading level one, all heading level two, H3, H4, all of these heading types, we're going to make them the color red. 
we want to change it to blue, we're making them the color blue. So a selector is simply saying, hey, take these types of elements, these kinds of elements, in this case, all these headings, and do what we say. Color one, what is that? Pound one, eight, zero, zero, FF. We can even, I'm just clicking to the right here, and you'll see it opens up a cursor. We can even say um, font family, let's see, comic sans MS. Is Comic Sans not, MS not working? Let's do Arial. Well, it's being overrided by a more specific style. Thank goodness, because Comic Sans would have ruined this. But that's the point. We have our HTML, all of our content on the left. And of course, over to the right, here we go. We can change font family on this specific class. If we want to change to Comic Sans MS. There it is. It worked. We have, of course, this is honestly offensive. Um, we have Comic Sans for Apple.com. Not the best design in the world. Apple's design was better. Uh, let's move on to Stripe. So again, we've covered the box model, the fact that everything on the web is made up of boxes that stack on top of each other and next to each other based on properties we set. We covered modifying actual content by right-clicking, inspecting, and saying, it's time to change whatever it's saying here. So 12-core CPU, more like 212-core CPU. Powerful. Uh, and of course, over here, we've destroyed Apple's, uh, frankly, beautiful design by changing it to a kind of gross blue color uh, with Comic Sans MS. So those are the changes we made to our content. That's a couple of the changes we made to our style. Let's look at Stripe. Uh, Stripe is is honestly one of my personal favorites uh, in terms of just the, the execution uh, of their design is I don't know. I would I would I would argue in many cases uh, second to none. Their documentation also is is absolutely epic. But it's the same story here. We have content on the page. It's being expressed. We know that this content is made of boxes. If you don't believe it, we can right click, go to inspect, and just like we did on apple.com, we can hover over and see that all of these things are expressed in different boxes. Some of these boxes are nested inside of boxes. We can always highlight and change text. Hello Greamer. How's your audio? Are you safe? Are you happy? And of course, we're changing that content. We know we can change colors. In this case, it's loading a variable color, but we can do something like change it to a searing green or an amber color. We know that. And of course, we know we can reorder stuff on the page. Whoa, look at this. It's a beautiful kind of grid-based design here. Um, OK, let's right click here, inspect. We're going to take a look at uh, this color right here. We're going to change it. And we know CSS lets us make a change on one thing. And based on whatever that selector is, in this case, it's copy body. And it affects, if you hover over, you can see the different types of elements it affects. We know that if we make a change once, we can say, hey, select all this stuff that has copy body and apply these changes. In this case, making it a searing green or amber color or maybe a white color. So that's what we covered in terms of HTML. It's very basic CSS. And the thing to know about CSS is we're talking about the basic fundamentals right here, right? We just talked about font family and uh, font size and uh, what do we talk about, color. Those are obviously very, very, very simple, but there are properties, there are CSS properties for everything. Doing 3D transforms, doing animations on hover, being able to create wild layouts using superpowers like CSS Grid and CSS Flexbox. There, <laughs> there's a property for almost anything you can think of. And the cool thing about CSS is you use these properties. Yes, you can define properties on any of these boxes, any of these HTML elements, but you can use classes, use, you can use tags. You can use essentially these selectors to select stuff on the page and say, I want to change all these things at once. I want to apply this styling to all these things to keep things neat and consistent. So I would love to take a quick second and pause and ask if any of our hosts uh, have any questions that we want to flag and bring up. And while we do that, I will also be moving over to Webflow. Creamer, how's your audio? You doing OK? I am back on. OK. Waiting to get back into the stage. OK. Heads up. Creamer is waiting to get back in the stage. Successful restart. Successful restart. And? And? and excited. Excited. OK. Ukarsh, if we can get uh, Greamer back into the uh, uh, stage, or if you want to ping him uh, directly, uh, we can do that. Any questions we want to flag first? Greamer, looks like you're in. Do I need to learn CSS uh, for Webflow? It's an interesting question. So 
like I said at the top, we'll be using the fundamentals of CSS. We'll be using some of the fundamentals of HTML. Um, but in terms of knowing the specific syntax, so for those of you who have deeply learned HTML, CSS, you're going to feel right at home in Webflow. If you haven't, uh, I would say the answer is yes, you will need to know some of the fundamentals, the core fundamentals of how it works. Just the concepts that we just covered, for instance, about selectors, the fact that we can select multiple things uh, and apply styles to them. Those concepts are really helpful. It's also really, really helpful when you're referencing something in Webflow to be able to check out documentation outside of even Webflow University. You can check documentation on MDN, Mozilla Developer Network. You can check documentation on W3C uh, and a million other resources that teach CSS because those things generally are going to apply to Webflow as well. So do you need to learn CSS to use Webflow? No. Uh, is it helpful to know those fundamentals of CSS and to know the fundamentals of how the web is built and put together? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I, I hear all the time from not only students, but from professionals uh, across a lot of different industries, freelancers, agencies, uh, even designers and developers at, um, at huge scaled organizations uh, who use Webflow, a lot of them learn a ton of the web fundamentals by using Webflow. That's another really good point, which is at the end of the day, if you're learning Webflow, you can very easily slip right over into writing CSS, into writing HTML, because now that you have those funda fundamentals, it's just about now knowing the syntax. So it's a really great question. Uh, do you prefer any HTML, CSS books? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Yeah, there's a long list and a ton that we have over here. Um, let's share that a little bit later. Yeah, Anybody I can, I can, find, I can find a few. Yeah, we have we have a ton here. There's some, there's some great stuff out there and some great courses online. <laughs> We're just literally running. Right now, you getting the HTML5 programming book, the head first? Yes. It's OK. You got it. All right, let's jump into Webflow. So uh, right on track, 830. Uh, keep those questions coming. Uh, we'll we'll definitely prioritize getting to more. And we'll leave some room at the end of this session to dig into some more questions as well. So thank you for those questions so far. Let's jump in to create a blank site. Now, if you don't have a Webflow account yet, that's OK. If you're following along directly, that's OK, too. If you're watching this recording later, Hello from the past. Uh, and we can always do this at any time. I'm going to create a blank Webflow site. Uh, and by default, it's saying Maguire's Dapper site. I'll leave that for now. And we'll hit Create Site. The reason we're doing this, the reason we're starting from scratch, is we want to apply some of those basic fundamentals from the beginning. So Webflow gives you really two options there. If you want to start from a template, there are tons of templates. Very often, that's a great way to dive right in and see how someone else puts something to, something together. So you see how they're using those web fundamentals to put things together. Uh, so templates are a great way to also learn and, and really dig in. Um, but we're going to be starting from this blank canvas. Nothing special here except for the fact that it is a blank Webflow project. And by default, we have a few things. I want to do a quick overview of the UI. For those who have used Webflow, this may seem a little redundant. Uh, maybe you'll learn something uh, new. For those who, uh, who haven't, we'll make sure to cover everything that's necessary to get up and running. Uh, Gramer, did you end up finding you seem to run <laughs> really? Like, yeah, all so uh, I found uh, two. Uh, these are, I think, uh, at first HTML and CSS, two uh, different people and two different editions. So I might be finding some more, but that, that's what I, I caught in like 30 seconds. I haven't read them yet, but it's on my list. So your book recommendation is two books you haven't read. but Yeah, they look list. nice. They look thick. It looks like there's a lot of good information in there, but I highly recommend them. Yeah, you got it. You got it, Creamer. You highly recommend them. All right, good. Uh, just a quick note, uh, Greemer, it does sound like your audio is coming from a different source. It sounds a little bit uh, wow. farther away. So if you want to fix it, you got it. You got it. Uh, OK, so a couple questions I want to address real quick as we're jumping into this. Uh, someone just asked, um, can I create a Webflow account or how can I create a Webflow account? At any time, Webflow accounts, by the way, are free. They will always be free. You can go in uh, and start for free. And Webflow, uh, in terms of uh, getting in, in terms of learning, in terms of building your, uh, building your site out, you can do that by going to webflow.com and clicking uh, to sign up, so create an account uh, from there. And what we do very often to save time is that we'll just use our Google login, or we'll just go in and create an account uh, to get started. So anyone can do that at any time, webflow.com. And then for the question regarding how do I learn CSS fundamentals, I strongly recommend, there's a lot of great stuff. We can share that a little bit later. But uh, I strongly recommend recommend Webflow University. Uh, we've actually put together Greamer uh, and the team, uh, and I put together um, uh, a number of courses and a number of videos uh, that cover the web fundamentals. Uh, I recommend starting with the Webflow 101 crash course. If you go through the 101 crash course, you're covering about 80% of 
how to use CSS and HTML already. You just happen to be using Webflow to learn it. Um, I strongly recommend uh, starting there. So with that in mind, this has been blank for like five minutes. Let's start getting stuff on the page. So we're going to do this in uh, a couple different ways. I said we'd cover some of the basics. Over to the left, these are our controls. Uh, one of the most important ones is the Add Elements button. So we'll just click here. And this is where we have all of our HTML, all the types of nodes, all the different types of elements we can load. Uh, eight, headings, paragraphs, text links, lists, buttons, hydrogen, all those kinds of elements. And what we can do at any time is go over there and drag stuff onto the page. So I want to start with a heading. Obviously, it's just a heading. I'm going to click and drag a heading in. So how is this expressed in HTML? It's exactly the same as if I were to put a normal H1, a top level heading in HTML. That's all Webflow is doing for us. It's not doing anything super fancy. It's not you know, creating layers of abstraction, uh, which ab abstract away the code. It's literally just a heading. Uh, and of course, I can double click at any time to edit the content on the page. And I can say, hello again, Greemer. Is my and audio working better now? Oh my god, it sounds, it's, uh, yeah, it's working. It's working. That's good. I'll take it's that. Like it was, it was a little intense. Was okay, I'll, I'll speak a little bit. No, no, yeah. I, I love that intensity. It's better okay. than caffeine. Might uh, be Frank. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll change that. Uh, okay. So we have hello again, Frank. Let's add some more stuff to the page. So again, we're going to go to the ad panel. These are our HTML elements. There's a lot more going on here, but we're just going to focus on some of these. Maybe we'll drag in a paragraph. We'll leave our lorem ipsum right here for right now, and maybe we'll put in a button. So we just have our basic building blocks, our basic nodes that we're loading on the page. So that's all we're doing. We're grabbing our HTML and we're bringing it to the page. So that's HTML. What about CSS? So if we look over to the right, this is Webflow's style panel. And the big secret about the Webflow style panel is other than the fact that you look at it and there's like, wow, a ton of properties, um, is this is where you control your CSS. All those things we were using before in Google, Chrome, and the inspector uh, in DevTools there, um, you can express those. You can modify those here. So you have access to all your things that control the spacing, the size, the positioning. I can keep reading the titles here. Uh, effects, all of our transforms, everything we talked about. And that's where you control your CSS properties. So let's do that. Let's actually have some fun with that. Now, we're going to do this. Again, this is just the first session. We're going to do some of the basics here. Later on, we're going to get into some advanced stuff like tags and how we can use them uh, really scalably to create huge, powerful websites. But for right now, we're going to do some basic stuff. So if we go up and with this heading selected, and we want to maybe change, let's just say this uh, font to, we don't have to load a custom one right now. Grimer, what's your favorite font we want to use here? I would say it's Times New Roman, just I classic. Knew you would, I knew mm -hmm. you would go with Times. That's great. Yeah. Um, the moment we make a change, there's a couple things to notice. One, we can see up here, in fact, let's just hit undo so we can see what happened here. So up here, it just has this blank field at the top of the style panel, no matter where you are, has this blank field that says selector. We covered selectors before. Again, a selector selects all elements of a specific type, and it applies styling to them. So we're going to do that again. We're going to go to font, and we're going to change. What was the font you liked, Grimer? Uh, Times New Roman. Times T -N -R. New Roman. T-N-R. 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 Well done. Yeah. Well done. Uh, but the moment we make a change there, Webflow will automatically create a class for us. And a class is just a type of thing that you can apply to different elements. And a class will take any type of styling that we have here. And there's only one type of styling we have, right? It's just Times New Roman. It's the only thing we changed. It takes that styling and it says, hey, we're, we're holding this information for you, for you. Where do you want to apply this? So we applied it, for instance, to this heading. What happens if we drag in another heading? Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's back to what it was before because it doesn't have that class applied. So let's take a look at that. If we select this heading and we go into that selector field, could we go ahead and change this stuff manually each and every time? Sure. But all we have to do is go into our selector field and we'll see we have existing classes or we could just type it heading and we're going to apply that class, this class that's right here to the second one as well. So what just happened? We applied the same class we just created, which we called heading. Let's call it super awesome heading just clicking and renaming that class just so we can see what's going on we'll get into class naming practices later um, and we'll see both of these elements because we applied it to the second one both of them have the super awesome heading class applied so why is that relevant well because if we change let's say the color like we did on apple notice how it's affecting both of them so let's change it back to black it's back to black we're going to change the font because greemer's font selection was a little uh, Greemer dated, that's fine. Maybe Oswald, okay. Impact, 
also a little dated. We want to switch it to system UI. We're on Mac OS here, so that'll be a, a representation of San Francisco. We could do that. So let's land on, let's say, Merryweather for right now. And we, of course, are applying those styles to both. If we change the size, so let's just click in the size field. We're going to hit up and down, or we can hold down Option or Alt and just click and drag. We can see the size is changing on each instance. Let's take this to another level. Copy and paste again and again and again. All these headings, because we're just copying and pasting them, it's bringing that class along with us. So we can change the content. Remember, classes and CSS don't affect content. It's just the styling and the layout. So we could say, Dreamer, is that you? It's me again, yeah. Yeah, OK, that's it's me again, yeah. So the content's different, but of course, we're keeping things even and consistent because we're using classes. We have the super awesome heading class applied. Is this always the best practice to use classes on all headings? Maybe not, but it, it really demonstrates that basic point, which is the style panel over here lets us control our style properties, and it lets us apply classes to different types of elements. Let's do this even more practically. Let's do this even more practically. Let's add a section inside. And we're going to add a section. Again, we're going to click and drag. In Webflow, you can click and drag on the canvas, this uh, big you know, white box. You can, you can, of course, do that. Or you can use the navigator over here. The navigator is just the hierarchy of what's on the page, the list of, of nodes, of elements on the page. So I'll just put the section right at the top. And if we want, we can just start dragging things into that section. So hello again, Frank. We can say, let's drag that, that paragraph inside. We're just clicking and dragging. You'll notice when we do that, it's actually nesting. We see inside the section, they're indented right here. So we're actually nesting this content inside. Why are we using a section? A few different reasons. Um, a section lets us control. This is a really, really, really big uh, advantage of using CSS and an advantage of using the box bottle, uh, which is how the web is built. We can select the section. And we can actually tell the children of that section what to do. We can actually control style and layout without having to manually drag things around the page. We can just select the parent element. So we're going to select the section. We'll do a few things. First off, let's add some padding, some space inside. So we're just going to push off the top, just clicking and dragging here, padding. You can see that express. It's just adding some space. What is that doing? It's increasing the size of that section, that, that box, that section box. It's increasing the height of it. But it's also pushing the content inside away from it. I think we're, you know, a lot of us here, uh, if we're into UI, UX, very familiar with this idea of padding. And of course, we're just adding spacing inside. Padding, of course, is space inside. So let's add padding on the bottom. Can't really see it, so we can always quickly add a little background color, maybe just a light gray color so we can differentiate. Is this the best design in history, Greemer? Yeah, I kind of like it. Um... Not where I was expecting you to go. <laughs> Fine, it works. It works. Let's select uh, the section. And with the section selected, notice how when we made these changes, it created a new class called section. We might use that later. Uh, but for right now, we just added that padding. Let's see if we can change our display controls. This is very, very powerful. We're going to use Flexbox. So in, right now, by default, a section takes up the full width, and all of the stuff inside of it stacks vertically. Each of those things are taking up full width here, and the button is over here. Let's select Flexbox. So with our section selected, we'll select Flexbox. And it looks hideous. What happened? Well, Flexbox by default is thinking, hey, we're going to take all stuff and we're going to kind of lay it out horizontally. But we don't want that. We want it vertically laid out. So let's just switch the direction to vertical. The moment we switch to, to Flexbox, we unlocked all of these controls. And now we can just align and justify however we want. Maybe that goes too wide. Maybe that paragraph goes too wide. Maybe we want it to never go wider, maximum width of, let's say, 500 pixels. Turn. We now have that blocked at max 500 pixels. Select the section again. And of course, we can align and justify however we want. So that's alignment and justification. The reason we're not moving up and down here, if you notice that justification control isn't doing anything, is because the section, all of the, all of, all of the height of that section is built on two things. One just the content inside. So if we add more paragraphs, notice how the section's getting taller. Uh, and if we delete those paragraphs, it gets shorter. That's the first thing. And of course, we added that padding, 100 pixels on the top, 100 pixels on the bottom. If we did set a height, if we said, hey, let's set it to 800 pixels, now if we justify, we see it moving around within that box. Again, the box model is just the idea that boxes of content are stacking on top of each other, and in some cases, next to each other, based on properties we set. That's literally it. And we can control those boxes by selecting the parent box, in this case, the section, and applying properties to it. We applied, of course, Flexbox. We want to go back to horizontal, back to horizontal, vertical, vertical.
We also covered padding, which is that space inside. What happens if we add more padding? Not a lot. And the reason, the reason is it's already 800 pixels tall, so it's not making it taller. But if we remove that 800 pixels, I'm just gonna click in that height, that property. Notice how every time we add a property, it changes that property label to blue. We can always remove our CSS properties. Just click height and we'll hit reset. And when we reset, of course, it's going to remove that change. It removed that height. Now, we'll get into this later, but there are tons of extremely powerful um, uh, CSS units that we can use here. So we can use, let's say, 60 VH for viewport height, and it'll be 60% the height of the viewport. So as we resize things, if we were to change the, the height of our viewport, which I'm grabbing Chrome right now and just resizing it, notice how that section's getting a little shorter getting a little bit taller. So there's a lot of responsive units like that that we can use to make sure that we're respecting the viewport we're in. Let's remove that property. We're going into reset. Or at any time, we can just option click. Let's try that option click on that label. So that's a section. The power of building the section this way and the power of using that class that was auto-created section, let's just call it great section. These are not the best CSS classes. We're just doing this to prove a point and really be able to quickly follow this. I'm going to call it great section. Let's copy and paste the section. Just going to hit Command C, Command V on Mac, or of course, Control C, Control V on Windows. So we have two sections now. Eh, let's do three. Copy and paste again. Now we have three sections. Hideous design, or as Greamer says, one of the best he's ever seen. Uh, but because we used classes, check this out. If we decrease the padding on any one of these, because we're seeing that it says great section, we're affecting the padding on all three. Notice how all three are being affected at once. This is, of course, how Apple maintains sections. This is how Stripe maintains sections. This is how Google, et cetera. This is how you maintain uh, different things by applying these classes, by applying, by taking these selectors and saying, we want to apply these CSS styles, these CSS properties to all of these things. If we change the background color, maybe we change it to a gradient. This is going to be even more hideous. If we change to a, a gradient, maybe something like that. We do a little angle change here. We're seeing that apply to all of them. If we said, this is beautiful, Maguire. Creamer, honestly, that means the world. Seriously, thank you. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm honestly thrown off. That's probably the nicest thing you've ever said about my work. Um, and I, frankly, I've needed that for for a while. Um, yeah, he's uh, actually he's he's gone now. Like it's me again. Wait, who? What? Oh, <laughs> no! I thought you were calling back Frank. I I don't know where he is. So I just like <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right. Hello again, Greamer. Uh, so we'll do that, of course. Uh, and of course, one last thing to show, if we change those alignment and justification properties, so if we set a height of, let's say, 600 pixels, and we start changing our alignment and justification, it's affecting all of those sections. So that's creating basic classes in Webflow and applying that to build a really simple layout. Is this the limit of what you could do? Of course not. This is super basic. Let's, uh, let's style a button real quick. Before we do that, uh, before we jump into uh, styling a button, let's, uh, oh, great, great question from uh, Anya, which is uh, some tips on translating from Figma into Webflow would be great. Got some really, really good stuff to share on that front. We actually have a full course on Webflow University. It's completely free. Everything on university is completely free. Webflow University, we have a full course uh, called Figma to Webflow. I'll show that real quick, which is, uh, where is it? Figma to Webflow right here. And it actually starts with the fundamentals of web design and Figma. So we actually do full web design and Figma. Uh, and then we actually create assets in Cinema 4D. You can skip this if you're not interested in using Cinema 4D. We just happen to use Cinema 4D. We love Cinema 4D. We also love Blender. We love Octane. We love Redshift. We use this stuff all the time. We can't get enough of, of 3D. Uh, but we'll cover that to create the assets that go into the lesson. And then, of course, we'll go into developing that site in Webflow. So it's that full process, that full handoff process from Figma to Webflow. Strongly recommend that course. Greamer is in that course. Our colleague Sada is in that course. Uh, our colleague Miguel is in that course. It's a really, really, really fun course. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. And look, I only have 10% of it completed on my account. Got to get, uh, Got to get on that. All right. So great question. Um, any other questions? Oh, oh, what about spline? I'm really, I have like this recency bias thing with the with the chat. I'm just reading the latest thing when I look over there. What about spline? Uh, we love spline. We've integrated uh, spline content into Webflow before. Essentially, yes, you can you can add spline pretty easily with a custom code embed in Webflow. So you know how we covered adding uh, you know buttons and headings. You can just in 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 Webflow, you can go in and uh, add a custom code embed. And when you drag an embed, you can paste custom code in that. And uh, we've done that before with Spline and a number of other tools. Uh, so really great. We love 3D on the web. It's 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 good. 
It's very good. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's style a button. So with this button selected, okay, again, we're just creating a new class here. Notice how we did not yet create a class for button. Let's just call this one. Again, we could start styling and it'll auto create a class, but let's create our class manually. So with the button selected, we'll go to the selector field right here. We'll just click and we'll say, um, we'll call it big button. Now we've created a class. So let's make some changes here. Let's make this a little bit bluer. That's OK. Let's maybe add some cornering radius here to make it a rounded button. Let's scroll up to the top and let's change padding. Now, what, what we saw before is we added padding on the top and we added padding on the bottom. Just hold down Option or Alt, click and drag, and we're affecting both sides, opposing sides at the same time. Same thing left and right. So we said big button. We'll make it a big button. A little less padding on the top and bottom. Maybe we'll change the typography here. Let's maybe increase the size. Again, holding Option or Alt. Um, to click and drag to affect all of it at once. That might be OK. Greamer, what do we want the button to say? I don't know, learn more, get in touch, something. Uh, maybe that's a little boring. Yeah, learn more, get in touch. Yes, exactly. And right. make it a little bit bigger. Perfect. Can't like, miss honestly, that one. It's a lot. I'm done now. So that's our button. Uh, it's it's something. Uh, we got that. So what do we expect to happen when we scroll down and look at the other button? Well, it does not look at all like that button. One, because the content is much more legible and not ridiculous over here. Uh, but two, and more importantly, we didn't apply that class yet. right? We created that class up here, and we started styling. We changed that color. We changed some of the typography. So what do we want to do if we want to apply that same styling to this one? Well, let's just click the button. We'll go into our selector field up here on the top right. And we'll go down and say, let's apply this existing class, big button. And now it matches that style. Same thing at the bottom. Hello again, Frank. Uh, we'll click on this button. We'll click into the selector. This time, let's type it. Let's type big button. We can just hit the down arrow. So it's selected right here. And then we can just, of course, hit return or click on it. And we have that class applied. Again, classes are powerful, just like we saw with the section. If you make a change on any one of them, it applies to all of them. So if we want to keep our buttons and our design consistent, we can do that. Again, if we change the padding on one of them, it affects all of them. A lot of people, a lot of designers, a lot of developers do not like padding numbers like 29 pixels or 13 pixels. So I'm going to leave it at 29 and 13. Uh, if you want to round it to something a little more even, you can. Honestly, it's bothering me too. Let's make it 30 and 15. And let's play with the uh, typography. Let's do all caps. Again, as we're adding these things, this is one of the things that's pretty powerful about Webflow. I'm going to go to the Help icon on the bottom. I'll click CSS Preview. Why are we doing this? Because we can actually see the CSS, the direct CSS that Webflow is spitting out right here. So. We're text that CSS property, text transform uppercase. That's all we're doing. This isn't magic. Again, this is literally just a visual representation of the same CSS properties that Apple uses and the same CSS properties that Google uses, et cetera. We're just applying them visually. That's what Webflow is. It's a visual development environment that gives you those same superpowers that developers have. And a lot of, in, in this case, what we're showing is a lot of front end stuff, a lot of those superpowers and exposing that in a direct way interface. When we make those changes, when we affect, let's say, padding on the left side, we're seeing that affected here as well. Back to 30, back to 30. So sometimes we like to have CSS preview on so we can take a look at those properties. So you can see that right over there, super uh, super awesome heading, font size 30. We see all those properties expressed in code. If we want, we can copy that clipboard. Maybe we're building an external app and we're working in another development environment, maybe we're in VS Code for something, we want to we want to steal that CSS, develop it visually in Webflow, copy it to your clipboard, paste it right in, that's it, you built that. Uh, one funny tidbit, which I, I absolutely love this story, uh, one of our incredible engineers at Webflow, uh, incredible software engineer, Federico. Um, Federico actually built CSS Preview, what you see here. He built this, uh, he's an incredible developer, but he built this UI in Webflow exported the UI for CSS, CSS Preview in Webflow uh, to build the CSS Preview in Webflow. So he like literally designed the UI for a thing that lets you click a UI and see how it was designed in Webflow. It's, it's wild, and it's just one of my favorite stories. So this UI, which is in Webflow, was built in Webflow. Uh, absolutely incredible. And he, he used it to copy the, the, uh, the CSS from here and actually pop it into uh, Webflow. It was great. Uh, so I'll close that out right now. 
Uh, and of course, I'm going to turn off all caps because there was a quick question on how you access it, accessed uh, the CSS preview. Oh, Can great. you do that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so if you go down at any time in Webflow, go down to help on the bottom left. And then up here, you'll see a few things. We're going to click CSS preview. And it shows up right there. And what you'll see is you'll see the CSS as it applies to whatever that currently selected element is. That paragraph, we only added one CSS property. We added that maximum width of 500. If we adjust that, we can see in CSS preview, it's adjusting. If we want to center that text, we can just align it center. So great question. Uh, so we have that. Let's do one more thing before we open it up for some more questions and wrap up for this early, early, early session. So big button. Let's select any one of these. And let's see what happens if we control what it looks like on hover. Before we do that, before we go to hover, let's add a little bit of a shadow and go down all the way at the bottom, going all the way at the bottom of the uh, style panel. And let's add a box shadow. And we can, of course, control this shadowing. I uh, will do a little bit more of a modern shadow design. So we'll decrease the size a little bit. Uh, and we'll dramatically increase the blur. Uh, let's decrease the size a little more. Let's increase the distance. Again, just holding down Option or Alt. The cool thing about this is you're able to see everything update in real time. Again, you're making the changes over here, but you're seeing this affected on the canvas in real time. And of course, we know the 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 drill here. If we were to make something gray, it might not look great on all backgrounds. So really a strong preference here is, of course, drop our alpha, drop our opacity a little bit. That looks OK. Looks good. What do we want to have happen on hover? Well, let's click over on big button and go to hover. We can do a more traditional hover. For instance, we could you know maybe darken the background a little bit. That's that's something. We can see what that looks like. So hover over. Of course, we're just hovering over. Again, we're just selecting the button. We're going over to the right of that class down here, and we're going to hover. And in there, we've just changed the color. We can do a lot here. Maybe we want to also affect maybe what happens on that box shadow. So maybe we want to increase the distance by, say, by five pixels. And maybe we want to increase uh, the blur a little more. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what happens, we can hover over and we see that change in real time. If we want to see it more precisely at any time in Webflow, we can go up here to toggle preview. And we can see what this is going to look like on the published site. So we just hover over and we're seeing what that button looks like on hover. But you know what? It's not good enough yet. Uh, let's select any of these buttons. And let's say on that hover state. So by default, when you select, you're not editing the hover state, right? You're in none. So let's go to hover. And let's do a, a 3D transform. Actually, we'll do 2D for right now. With a uh, 2D transform, we're just going to add a transform. And we're going to say, hey, we want to move this thing on hover. We can move it down. We can move it up. I'm going to move it up. Let's just say five pixels, just for the heck of it right now. We'll move it five pixels. What, what happens if we just do that? We can see if we hover over, it moves up five pixels. OK, that's fine. It's not the best UI in the world. But it'll prove a point, and that's, that's good enough. Um, we can do that. So we'll move it up five pixels. Actually, just to be dramatic, let's move it up. really see what's going on. OK, that is a mediocre button. It would be kind of cool if it kind of goes all the way to the uh, the heading. <laughs> you want it to go all the way to the It's going to yeah, just like, whoop, Yeah. All right, let's do it. We're, we're going to do, we're going to do it. The problem is when you hover over it, it's no longer going to be hovered over, so it's going to glitch. All right, let's see. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh this is. This yeah, is no, I really like this. This is like, you really notice oh. the button. How how do we ever select it again, Kramer? How are we ever going to change this? That's nobody's going to leave the website. It's fun. Like they're constantly trying. Is this how you reduce your bounce rates for all your sites, Kramer? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Kramer has like a zero percent bounce rate on every site he makes because he makes it impossible to leave the site. <sighs> so, it's all about the data, Maguire. <laughs> it's all about the data. So with uh, all, because it's so difficult to select now because of this ridiculous thing Greamer said to do, we can, of course, use our navigator over here. We can find that specific button, any of these buttons. We can select it. And for the love of all things holy, let's go to hover again. And let's <laughs> remove that ridiculous thing. We'll make it a little more reasonable, at, let's just say, like 14. And the last thing I want to show is this. Let's, let's, let's add another property. Because we're already in a ridiculous let's let's just let's just do it. Let's add another transform and we'll rotate it. And we're gonna do it this way. This looks ridiculous. We're gonna rotate the button a lot. Where was that? 900 degrees. Yeah, that's fine. 1081 degrees. Let's just have a really odd number. Um, so click out what happens. You can't really see that transition. So what do we do? Let's select the button and let's add a transition. And what type of transition do we want? Do we want to transition opacity? We haven't really changed the opacity. So let's instead 
click this and we see all of our properties we can transition. Let's transition those transforms that we just did. And oh my God, that's that's intense. Let's slow that down a little bit. Let's increase that duration. Uh, Grimer, what's a good duration? Uh, 17,000. That's Milliseconds? possible. 17,000. Yeah. So that's 17 seconds. So will it take 17 seconds to hover over this button? Let's test out Grimer's numbers here. We're going <laughs> to... Should we do the large button or the small button? Let's start with the small one and we'll see how the large right. one. So we'll hover over and over the next 17... Over the next 17 seconds, we're gonna we're gonna watch this transition happen. So what is it doing? It's interpolating between these two states, right? In none, it was however it normally looked. And on hover, we rot rotated it was at 1081 uh, degrees. It's doing that. And if we hover out, it's gonna transition back. And it does that because we added a transition that if I can't look at it. We added a transition that affects Grammar, you're gonna have to Yeah, we should have uh, can't talk right now. We should have alerted for some motion sickness. So uh Please do not watch it. McGuire, you need to stop it. <laughs> I, I did. I hovered out. All right. And just a dram if anyone has any uh, Dramamine to take to reduce this uh, this uh, motion, this is a huge motion warning, but I think we should try the I think we should try the top button. We're at 859. We got to try the top button. Yeah? You got to do it. All right. Here we go. We're going to hover over the top button. This reminds me of the original uh, Nintendo, uh, the, the fire level when he's uh, in the, the last... Battle boss level. Actually, this is pretty cool. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. All right. So we're at eight fifty nine. Going to wrap up right now, but uh, we covered a lot of the basics, and I'm I'm really excited that we did this together. Essentially, we learned the basics of the box model. Again, the web is made of boxes that stack on top of each other and next to each other based on properties we set. We covered HTML. HTML is the type of content and what order it's in on the page. And we covered CSS. CSS is the styling and layout. We can apply things like classes to multiple elements and keep things even and consistent using that. So with that, Udkarsh, I'm going to pass it back to you uh, to wrap us up for this session. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Maguire and Grimmer. I am very sure that everyone enjoyed it a lot and had a fun session today. So stay tuned with us for the next session day after tomorrow, same time. That is 26th Jan, 8 AM Pacific time. And for people after the session, you can network around with uh, the other fellow learners in the network launch that we've created out for you. So once the session is ended up, so you can see at the network launch and you can network around. For the next session, we will have McGuire and Grimmer again. So yeah, stay tuned and see you guys uh, day after tomorrow. Thanks a lot again. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for attending. Had a great time. See you later.